everybody. Am I am I in frame here, Alex? I'm good. I'm just going to start talking. So, welcome. This is a working group, and the way it works is by you all coming to contribute and participate. And uh, the the concept around inbound marketing is what we're here to learn. Uh, we really want to focus on the end users. Uh, so. Uh, over time, what we're trying to do is fill the programming with customer stories, uh, strategy pieces from uh, leading edge software companies. Uh, we have an upcoming meeting, so mark your calendars, July 20th. Um, there's a company called Uberflip that has uh, introduced us to one of their customers here in, in one of the Silicon Alley successes, uh, Booker.com. And um, uh, so we're in the process of getting that, but mark your calendars, same time on uh, Monday, July 20th. And, and the idea is to learn from people like uh, uh, the, the CMO at Booker.com, authors. So we have Ruth Stevens tonight uh, talking about uh, data-driven inbound. Um, but the learning is not only from the presentations that we're downloading to you, but it's also uh, by meeting and building your network and, uh, and learning amongst each other. So we're also experimenting, and this is truly an experiment to bring this to a Google Hangout, which is uh, what you see blocking my face right here. Um, but we're we're doing live television. If you think about it, you know, you look at some of the great television moments that came out uh, of the golden era of television. It was around live television, and it got boring once it became a formula. So we're inventing it as we go here. I welcome your feedback. If you're watching it online, we welcome your feedback. Um, and uh, we're going to continue to evolve, evolve this. We'd love to get networking online as well. Um, we're using meetup.com slash inbound as, as our uh, online source. So keep tr if you're uh, actually everybody here is probably signed up. Uh, but if you haven't online, uh, go to meetup.com slash inbound. Um, and, and one of the keys is that we're uh, going to be platform agnostic. So uh, we're a HubSpot. VAR, my company, Austin Lawrence Group, does uh, strategy. We help figure, figure out who your audience is, what to say to them, how to do the messaging, and how to make all this technology work so that we actually use it to get you customers. Uh, we do inbound marketing, and we manage campaigns on a, on a retained basis. So for companies that uh, have a, a niche that they want to have a sustained presence in, we'll manage that for them. And then we produce uh, content and media. Uh, and as our roots is a, a, for 30 years in, in public relations, we've produced a lot of content, events, um, video. Uh, we've just started producing webinars. Our latest one uh, had over 200 attendees with a 75% uh, attendance from those who registered. So um, it's all about building your audience and, and programming to them. And, uh, and, and so those three things are, are what we focus on. Um, We've given people an opportunity to come up tonight and say what they're doing. Normally with a smaller crowd, I, we go around the room, but we're just not gonna have time tonight. A um, Couple other things, uh, Joseph mentioned the venue, but when I talked to Karen, who's been our, our contact here, she also wanted us to let you know that if you're looking to have an event, uh, they'd love to talk to you. And if you want more information about uh, putting on a, a, an event here at, at the General Society, please see me. Um, we have a, um, a, did we bring the raffle? We got a raffle going. So we're giving away, if you haven't put your business card in the bucket, we're giving away a JBL uh, Bluetooth speaker. And uh, make sure you do that. And um, doo -doo 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 -doo. if you need Wi-Fi, the password is library guest. Um, don't need to chew up your data. Um, I also am running an event next week, and we're looking for a blogger to be on a panel by phone uh, to talk about blogging and best practices and some of the lessons learned. So if you uh, have a blog or involved in producing a blog, we'd love to talk to you um, and, and have you on a, a, a meeting that we have next week um, on the 16th. And um, the last thing I want to do before I introduce, well, no, I'm going to actually do that after we're done. I'm good. Ruth, are you ready? All right. So um, Ruth Stevens is a uh, author and, um, and consultant in, and does customer um, 
acquisition and retention and has a strong, you know, what's, what I love about inbound marketing is it brings so many disciplines. I was talking earlier to somebody about content marketing was thought leadership and inbound is then using, channeling that thought leadership to bring people from a general audience to a specific customer. And it's the managing that process. And I think a lot of the things that make up inbound marketing today come out of the direct marketing world. And, uh, and, and Ruth has, has a very strong background in that uh, with B2B marketing. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Ruth Stevens. And, uh, Like me to stand in front of this lovely camera? Yeah, look, look good like a so sort of a, a trading area yeah. around here. Okay, good. Like the screens, the locks. But, but I did forget my clicker. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here today, everybody. I um, I'm sorry. Just stand back. Stand back? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Very happy to be standing back here today, <laughs> um, everybody. And um, you may. Um, be wondering what this is all about and um, Keith asked me to speak about data-driven angles to inbound marketing um, specifically because I am publishing a book this month on the subject of data-driven marketing in business markets I specialize in B2B marketing selling to other businesses where the basic value proposition is most of the selling is done by a salesperson, whether it's a house salesperson or a, a, a dealer or, a, or an agent. And the marketing function is intended to make that salesperson more productive. And data becomes a really important part of that. So that's, that's what, what my book is gonna be about. But when it comes to inbound, marketing data can also be extremely helpful as as um, a, a part of the inbound marketing world so i wanted to begin by sharing uh, a hilarious cartoon that I, I came across recently and this is as if we were in a 12-step meeting and i might say to you hi my name is ruth and i'm a data nerd or something like that um, and I think the, the reason this cartoon is so funny is that all of us, except for a very small few, generally have a mixed relationship with data. Um, anyone who hated math in school sort of wishes data would go away. <laughs> we didn't have to think about it. Um, people who are in the creative side of marketing also sometimes wish data would go away because they don't want the results of their campaigns to be judged by such things as data when they have such a great idea and why wouldn't you know why would they use anything else than you know my idea is so fabulous so um, th this last panel I thought was particularly hilarious because once you've accepted that data needs to be part of your life, then you can say, well, I want the data that's going to support what I was planning to do, <laughs> planning to do anyway. But this also got me thinking about data um, for, that can be used for making decisions because marketing is really only one set of decisions that a, a business has to make. And if you're interested in the subject of using data to help business people make decisions, I wanted to recommend a book to you. This is, of course, not my book. Why am I recommending not my book? This is, I need to work on my self-promotional skills here. But, um, <laughs> but this guy, Tom Davenport, wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review um, a few, and then expanded it into a book. So by the way, if you don't want to read the whole book, just get the HBR article and it sort of covers the concepts. But he, this is the single best resource on the subject of letting data help you make business decisions. So I think you, uh, you might 
if if you're if you're actually interested in data and think it has value, you might want to want to look at this book. But what I'm really here for um, is is to talk about how data can be applied to inbound, specifically in the area of business to business. Now, can I just see a show of hands? How many of you are focused on business markets, meaning you're selling to other businesses versus consumers. Keith, thank you. You've brought out a group of people who are, you know, my peeps. <laughs> this, this is great. And, but I also hope that um, those of you who are in consumer markets will find some of these concepts worthwhile. And if not, feel free to just get up and go have a glass of wine and, you know, we can, and do something else. But, in business markets, I think those of you who are in B2B will agree that the job of business marketing is generating leads. Are you with me on that? Yes. Oh, yeah. um, you know, this, this slide it is uh, from 2000, a 2012 report, so it's, and it's a bit dated by now, but every piece of research talking to business marketers and saying, what's keeping you up at night? What's on your plate? What do you really need to deliver? It's all about lead quality and lead quantity. Because that's what salespeople need. Salespeople want to reduce the amount of cold calling they have to do, and they rely on marketing to provide them with leads. And this is true today in modern content marketing, which I know is a, a big part of inbound. Even in content marketing, leads are the number one by a huge margin, 59% versus the next one at 43%. When you ask content marketers, what are they trying to do? It's, it's generate leads. So um, it's to that end that I wrote my book. So now I'm going to promote my book. Sorry. <laughs> um, and in fact, my publisher had told me that the book was going to be printed by today. And so I could show it to you and maybe even persuade you to buy a copy, but it's not printed today. So, um, so Keith said we could maybe share with you guys later um, a, a little notice when the book is really published and you can go pick it up on Amazon or something. Absolutely. And this is the table of contents. Um, so you can see that you know, I, I sort of tried to cover, tried to cover everything. And, and my mission was to demystify data in business marketing for those people who are math phobes or scared of it. This sort of explains what it's all about. And people who are deeply technical will find this to be good strategic thinking, I hope anyway, I think it's pretty good, um, that will help you put data in a business context and I hope that'll be helpful. So that's my sales pitch and I thank Keith for giving me the opportunity to pitch, uh, pitch the book to you. But what we're really here for is to talk about inbound marketing and how data plays in that world. So I thought before I go ranting and raving about this subject, I would ask you all, what do you think when you hear the term data-driven inbound marketing? What does it really mean to you? What were you expecting that I might talk about today? What is data-driven inbound marketing? Anyway, please. What, what's your name, please? Mike Scheid. Mike, hi. Okay, so right. what, what do you think? I think a lot about iteration, you know, instead of just throwing out a bunch of stuff and hoping, you know, you don't know which half of your advertising converts and seeing what works, what doesn't, chopping out the stuff that doesn't and doing that over and over again until you've got leads. Right, so, so uh, in other words, Mike is saying it's about helping you evaluate what works, conducting more effective campaigns, using the data to analyze results. So that's about metrics and refining of campaigns. How many of you find that of interest today? So you're, well, fortunately, that is one of the subjects that I was planning to talk about. <laughs> Good. Anything else? P Penny, right? It's Ellie. Ellie, that's sorry. Thanks, Ellie. Yeah, that's a nice name, isn't it? So, Penny, what? <laughs> Penny, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Anyway, um, what were you well, thinking? Well, what, what, I'm one of those um, writer people who 
was bad at math. However, mm. um, over the last few years of doing email marketing, I've gotten to love data because I can I can finally prove, which I couldn't do in PR, how I'm moving the needle. Right. And um, but what I I need to get to the next level and understand um, how to be a data detective and oh. um, you know figure out how to drill down, learn a little bit more about how to recognize things that are happening that don't necessarily meet the eye right away, mm, despite you know, what to do with data to drill down. Yeah, yeah. So so Ellie's looking for more insights out of her out of data to help her understand what's really going on and understand her customers better. Right. So yeah. I do have a couple of comments to make on that subject. Um, I, what I thought you guys were going to say is, you know, when are any of you using marketing automation like HubSpot? And how many of you are using HubSpot, for example? And how many of you, are, of course, five of you are in the same company? So that's <laughs> All right. So how many of you are using marketing automation like Marketo or Eloqua, Sugar CRM? Yeah, what are you using as Pardot? Heloise, right. Um, Pardot, very, a very, very good company. All now owned by Salesforce. Salesforce, right? And what are you, what have you been using? Eloqua. Eloqua. Very complicated, right? You have to be really, really good to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, see. The, the reason I thought uh, I'm, I'm asking this question is that many marketers, um, you know, the way inbound marketing is set up in marketing automation is entirely data driven in the first place. Um, inbound marketers look at statistics about uh, the number of views I had on my various blog um, articles and they make decisions about um, further communications or further posts or further content development based on that analysis. So to be a good inbound marketer, you are sort of by definition data driven. So that's what I, I would have thought that, that many of you might be thinking about. But instead, what I'm going to talk about is three strategies for applying data to the inbound marketing mission. And um, one of them is, is uh, the one that we spoke about earlier, namely uh, measuring what you're doing so that you can do it better, refine it, um, and, and, uh, and test your way. But the first one I want to talk about um, is segmentation and modeling. And the reason I want to talk about this segmentation and modeling is and you know, I'm sort of going out on a limb here. So if if I cut the limb off and crash and burn, please, you know, be be gentle with me. But um, I want to say that inbound marketing as a concept suffers from two fundamental problems. Um, and I, you know, I'm hesitant to say that at a group that's devoted to inbound marketing. <laughs> So I may be, you know, you may, you can shoot me. But um, the first problem that I see is that um, inbound marketing, especially as preached by vendors like HubSpot, and I, you know, I shouldn't really blame them, but there are a lot of devotees to inbound marketing. You're nodding your head. What do you think I'm going to say? Uh, no, I just, I've been going to the inbound office for a while. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like I mean, a religion. When you, right? said, when you said devotees. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's what it is. You're caught up in the terminology, not the reason why that terminology was there in the first place. And you know, and that's that's okay. Um, but what bothers me is that the devotees tend to feel that outbound communications is somehow less desirable. Uh, and I believe I'll just lay my cards on the table. I think we need both, inbound and outbound. And the reason is that. Inbound, as wonderful as it is, the idea of attracting someone when he's interested in your topic and um, then engaging and 
persuading them to have a conversation and, and kick off a relationship, that's great. But you're going to be leaving business on the table if you are not conducting outbound messaging to target audiences to try to try to persuade them to hear your hear your story. So that's one one issue I have with inbound. It's really not inbound itself. It's the way inbound is positioned. Now, the other issue that I have with inbound is that you sort of lose control of the messaging, meaning you if people are being attracted to to come to you, you're not choosing them, they're choosing you. So the difficulty is what if you're attracting a bunch of prospects who are never really going to buy from you, who are unqualified or who are not really good solid prospects. Um, an outbound marketer can mitigate that by selecting target audiences very carefully. So what inbound marketers can do to mitigate that is what I'm getting to here is by developing programming and messaging content and other inbound activities that are specifically designed to attract the most productive prospects and frankly to repel the less productive prospects the one the tire kickers the guys who are you know just never going to buy from you and so the best way to do that is here's i'm finally getting to the point using data to understand your target audience so that you can develop materials, programs, content that really works for them, attracts them and repels others. So I want to just speak very briefly about the process of segmentation and modeling to identify the low hanging fruit, the sweet spot, the highest value prospects for your, for your, um, your, your, your offering. And the first step is known as segmentation. Does everybody in the room generally understand what segmentation is? Okay, I'm not gonna. Um, and we have some marketing students from NYU here who I'm just gonna put them on the spot. Are you guys comfortable with the concept of segmentation? We don't have to explain it? Feeling good? All right, all right, so. <laughs> I'm very, Please. I don't know anything about marketing, so this is all brand new to me. Would you mind just explaining this? Briefly, um, a segment is a group of customers or prospects who are similar within themselves, meaning they're alike each other, and they're different from everybody else. That's sort of all a segment is. As marketers, we want to identify segments that we can actually take marketing actions against, meaning we can find them. And the, it's a substantial enough segment for us to invest marketing effort and, and dollars in. So that's, that, that's the thing. So most of us will segment our audiences by characteristics known as variables. These are the typical variables in business markets, industry and company size being the two leading drivers of business to business segmentation, mainly because that tells you how they buy. You know, buying is different industry to industry and company size, and by company size. Consumer markets will tend to select segments based on variables like this. So segmenting your target audience um, into like groups so that you can treat them according to their needs is sort of job one of, of a, a marketer. Um, and the easiest way to segment is by collecting a lot of data about them and their characteristics and conducting the segmentation using, using data. Once you've developed a simple segmentation, then you can begin thinking about building predictive models. Any of you building models today? Enjoying model building? What are you doing, Frank, in the, mo in the model? What has world? primarily to do with uh, segmenting my particular audience that I deal with? And uh, I, may be, I may be misunderstanding what you mean by uh, model, uh -huh. but in yeah. terms of building an avatar, in terms of who I would be speaking to, what is the age group, uh, what's, the, what's their background? Right. What, this kind of thing. Is okay. That what you mean by um, I, it, it sort of does, but a model is typically 
used as a term to describe a statistical um, and a projection uh, based on 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 key variables. So yeah, I, this might be know if it, had to do with this. it might be a regression model. So I'm I'm really talking about database marketing uh, models or data driven marketing models. In this example. Um, which I, of course, just copied from somebody else's model. Um, it, we're, uh, we're trying to decide who are our best customers. And uh, identifying your top customers is a very fine use of predictive modeling. Um, and in this example, we took our customer base and divided them into four equal parts by value, known as these are known as quartiles or quarters of our customers. And then we determined what kind of um, industry these guys were in. And in this example, we found, uh, by the way, the top quartile is, um, is the green, the top green. We find that it's these national and e-commerce retailers that tend to comprise the bulk of our top customers. So if you knew this, that, there, that your top customers tended more to be in this group, retailers, versus manufacturers in this group, what could you do differently with your inbound marketing based on having that information? What, might, what action might you take knowing that I'm more likely to have top customers who are retailers versus manufacturers? What might you do? change your messaging that makes all of your content extremely related. Yeah, you might develop content that speaks specifically to this type of retailer. So it's this modeling allows you to understand who are your target audiences, and especially if you can identify the top customers, the most valuable prospective customers, then that will help you reduce waste by creating inbound programs that are likely to attract them. Question. So in this interest in this example, yeah. modeling also um, identifying who didn't say contacts. I heard a woman mention Pardo and I used to do Salesforce. Mm -hmm. So now could I weed out those that are in positions that are with manufacturing companies, change the messaging for this gentleman behind, yeah. and tweak it to people that are IMD national buyer at Walmart, IMD national buyer at Costco, whoever by position create. Is that a model that can be done? Uh, what is this word that you're using? Data driven? Um, uh, you, what, the, I, the concept here, the inbound marketing concept says, I'm not going to go out to uh, an audience of retailers versus manufacturers. I'm going to try to attract them to come see me. And, you know, this is, this is sort of your model will have a lot more granularity and allow you to make better decisions than between these two. So give me an example of an external input that would go into the business model. I got it now. It's not what I already have. I'm going to the universe outside. What would be an example of a variable that I can use if I'm building this data-driven campaign that's going to draw people to me using that? Uh, yeah, so most in when we talk about in, inbound marketing tactics, and there's you know, some debate about what really qualifies as inbound. But I usually think of it in the following four areas. Search engine optimization, blogging, content development, and what's the fourth one, Keith? Social media. Social networks. Right, social media. Thank you, Ellie. You saved my bacon. Um, and so in, in that context, the more you know about your top prospects, the more you can create programs within those four areas that will appeal to them. So that's really what we're talking about here. I think another thing that you can do mm -hmm. is find communities and ecosystems that are around your top audiences, right? So I mean, you can create blog posts all day long and have them sit in your blog, but it's not going to get found. But if you find all of the national and e-commerce retailer in a LinkedIn group and start engaging with them. It's better than just sticking it on your LinkedIn page or tweeting it out to everyone. Exactly. And that becomes, and then, you know, we could have a debate 
is going to a LinkedIn group and starting a conversation and engaging with those people. Is that inbound or outbound? It's sort of a fine line. So anyway, but but it's a great example, Keith. We're getting uh, feedback online, and one of the questions was, are the charts going to be available? Yes, I, I'm going to produce a PDF that you can distribute to your to, to, to your audience. But you know, it's already quarter of eight, and I realize I'm uh, I got to pick up the pace here. Um, but I did want to share two techniques that business marketers are likely to use, having segmented, modeled, and identified their top prospects. So, and the first one is they may create a so-called persona. Are you familiar with this concept of persona? It's, it's a descriptive, it's a verbal description that allows you to develop good quality messaging. It's sort of a way to describe your audience in words. And then um, it, it allows you to create good content. Um, personas used to be called profiles. Persona is the more modern, modern uh, usage. The second thing that you might do, and this I've already mentioned, is develop content specific to the needs of these top segments that you're going after. And in business market markets, we tend to segment our messaging not only by the audience, but their role in the buying process. And in business markets, there are a lot of different roles that an individual might comprise, like this the decision maker or is he the specifier so and the needs of these people are different so the content might be different and wait there's more we also tend to consider the buying journey also known as the buying process which in b2b tends to be fairly strictly uh, defined and easy to understand um, so we would develop content that suits the needs of someone early in the buying process, in the middle, and in the late part of the, uh, and these are some examples of the types of content that suit different stages of the buying process. So this can all get, get pretty crazy, but you see how the data that helped you develop segments and models to understand your top prospects can be then converted into content and personas that support those those particular buyers and, and buying journey. All right. Now the second big idea or strategic approach is about measurement, which was the point that you were making about using uh, data to analyze campaign results. You know, B two B marketers say when you know content being the hallmark of inbound inbound marketing that half of them say that they're having trouble measuring their campaigns. So, you know, we need to get on top of this and, um, and, and improve our, our measuring strategies. But um, this is how data is typically used in, in inbound marketing programs, either identifying the metrics by which we're going to assess campaign results and or setting benchmarks against which the campaign pre and post can be um, be assessed. So I'd like to just share with you a, a list of the typical metrics that inbound marketers use to determine um, success. I, I like to um, divide these into activity-based metrics, which are sort of under our control and um, fairly easy to capture, versus results-based metrics, which usually depend, at least in business to business, um, on a sales force able to close the business and report back to marketing what actually happened. Um, if you're selling through e-commerce, I know a, a number of you in the room are, are selling directly through e-commerce, this data t tends to already be extremely accessible and, 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 and not an issue. Um, some of the applications that uh, these metrics can be put to to particular inbound <clears throat> tactics are listed here. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but they range from such a simple one as, okay, I'm going to look at every blog topic I've ever written on, and I'm going to sort them by popularity. And I'm going to say, which are the topics that my audience wants to read the most 
based on shares or views or whatever. And I'm going to do more of that and less of what they're not interested in. So it's pretty, pretty simple. It can go all the way to more complicated applications like split testing, which is what you were talking, alluding to, um, and um, refine and continuous improvement through um, through split and, and other testing to refine refine your results. So that's the the second big idea. And in this in this application, I've got a case study to share with you about a software company in Europe that sells, guess what, CRM software. Mm -hmm. So, But what's different about these guys is they're selling to the low end, the small and medium business market. So this is low priced, and they are competing with Microsoft and Salesforce.com, who have huge budgets for marketing, right? And so these guys thought, oh, and by the way, their software comes in six different European languages. So you can imagine what their websites are like. Everything they do has to be translated into, into six languages. Um, but in order to compete with Salesforce and, um, and Microsoft uh, CRM, they figured that the relatively low cost tools of inbound marketing would be a way to attract these SMB buyers. <coughs> so they began with a benchmark of 32,000 visitors coming to their site through their organic, you know, um, inbound marketing. And their objective with this, this new approach was to double that. So here's what they did. They, in effect, uh, the company is called Super Office. I don't know about that brand myself, but it sort of says what they do. It's very European. It's very European. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they conducted a number of inbound marketing campaigns, beginning with search engine optimization using keyword research um, in six languages. But a couple of angles here that I thought would interest you is that they did their analysis by, uh, their, they also did a competitive keyword analysis. So this is not an, un, uh, it's, a, it's an important angle. And so then they selected, they said, we're gonna concentrate on keywords that are of great value to our audience, but our competitors are not as strong in. So we sort of have an opening. Um, and you know, I, I thought this was really, really smart of them. They noticed that the keyword phrase, and this is all long tail, you know, multi-term multi keywords, customer service email templates is a term that had almost no content, so they dived into that vacuum created a bunch of content, including a blog post called Seven Customer Service Email Templates Every Business Needs. And it was very popular and very successful. So this kind of analytic approach can really help them find uh, opportunity. So do they actually have seven templates for customer service? Or I certainly have... hope so. I mean, today, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm wondering. Well, you know, in, in this particular case, uh, as something I didn't mention, there are only two people in the inbound marketing department here, and they do all the writing in-house. So I presume they wrote good quality content. You know, if the content didn't deliver against the, the, the uh, offer, then it, they're going to go out of business. Yeah, quick question. So if you type in customer service email templates, and you say there's no content, what would be there? Just a bunch of random pictures and you know, stuff. That doesn't no, no. Um, I I don't know. No blog post Could you no take blog. out your phone and <laughs> check it down? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just relaying the, the the case story. I think the concept here is that they they found that there was an underserved content niche and and, and they they strive to to fill it. Now, on the, the next tactic. Um, that they used, of course, was social media. Thank you, Ellie, for uh, saving me on that. And th this is quite interesting. You know, many of us feel that if we're going to um, be promoting our content through social media, that we have to be very, very active. And they found, actually, that when they come up with a new piece of content, like a new blog post or a new white paper, that they were doing fine if they posted it on Twitter three times a day 
and um, a, a couple of times a week <coughs> around the launch, but um, they, um, on LinkedIn, Google Plus, and Facebook, they were only posting once. So this might be a, a, a clue about, you know, a, a, that we all have questions about, about um, frequency. But what I, I, I found here is that with that level of effort, they were getting uh, abundant social sharing. Now, I presume their content was very well titled and uh, attractively, attractively positioned. Now, the next tactic um, was white papers, which, again, they wrote in-house. They were designed by a third-party marketing agency. And these are, this is the kind of landing page they used. They were picking topics based on analytics, of course, keyword research, industry trends, and the Google Analytics of their own website um, to determine which topics to, uh, to, to produce. And then another um, point that they made is blog posting, which they ended up only doing weekly. Originally, they had thought that they need to feed the blog machine a couple of times a week, but it, it turned out that um, actually, you know, they had started with 14 authors and three, three posts a week, and they saw that there was almost no improvement it, by cranking up the blog, so they pulled back again to only one um, post a week, but a longer, more meaty, sub substantial post, and that was the formula that, that really worked for them. Here's a, an example of one of the, um, the, the blog posts that, that they published. Then um, the, the last tactic that they've uh, included is email. Now, the question is, is this inbound or outbound? <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Um, the, but this is in Europe, remember, where privacy laws are considerably more stringent than they are here. This is a 50,000 name subscriber file of opted in subscribers. And every time a new post, whether a white paper or blog post was launched, they would send it out to their email. E email list. And they also added a new technique of resending the email to subscribers who hadn't opened the first one. And so they found that those, uh, th those emails provided a, a, a delightful spike to um, both social shares and traffic on the website. They also added a quarterly analytics strategy of website optimization, page by page, looking at the page rankings <coughs> of their site. And if the rank was less than they wanted, they would upgrade it with better title tags, better content, or trying to uh, do internal links, like information between a blog post and a, and a white paper internally to stimulate um, that, that kind of connection. So here, here is an example of how, how they did that. So I'm, I'll just let you read that later. So here are the results that were shared in this case study. They met their, their goal of doubling um, organic traffic. They also um, improved their lead productivity. And they found that by picking very carefully the, act the inbound marketing activities they were going to do, they were able, with only two people, to, um, to deliver extraordinary results, all based and fine-tuned on data and, and analysis. Any questions or comments? Are, are you guys falling asleep? Ready for some, for some wine? There's just one more idea that I want to share great, with you. It's a great case study. It is good, isn't it? I can, sh I, I can share with you the link um, where the entire case is, is laid out. Now, I just want to get to this third idea, which is uh, very quick, but the idea here is instead of thinking about how we're going to use data to make our inbound marketing better, I want to suggest that you can also use your inbound marketing to make your corporate data strategy more productive. And the idea here is that all of this activity to attract people to your site 
has enormous data implications for your firm. And I'm going to make a pitch here on the subject of whether you are going to gate your content or let it run free. Are you guys familiar with this ongoing debate? The question is, should we post our content at the website and let anybody get it? This is the way blogs are usually offered. White papers, on the other hand, research reports. It's a question. Are we going to ask? that our respondents give us their contact information before we let them have the paper? This is known as gating. And if we don't gate, we don't have their address. So, you know, people who say, we don't want to gate because we want to cast a wide net and let everybody understand our thought leadership, our, our, our ability to solve business problems, our skills, and make it available to the world. And others say, well, wait a minute. If I'm producing this white paper and giving it away, I really want to know the name of the person so that I can continue a marketing relationship with him or her. So where do you guys come out on this uh, subject? So yeah, I've debated this for a while. It's a tough one, isn't it? Because if you use a, you'll know when you're using it as well. When you're on a website that is a HubSpot customer, yeah. it's very apparent. You can see it in design, you can see the yeah. language. Yeah. And what's annoying is when you fill out something, if you, if you use it, you, something, you know that once you fill out something, they already know who you are. First time you do it, they tag your IP, and every single time you do anything, they can read everything. Yeah. Which is really good. It's like kind of privacy in tech, but like their goal is to sell you. So it's not really to be any use for any scary thing. And uh, what I've settled on is do it once the first time mm -hmm. if you're using the right software like HubSpot yeah. because you don't need to, the whole reason why you gate them again is to figure out who they are so you can track who they, what they've done. Right. Most likely if you've chosen a topic that you want to gate that's very vague that a lot of people are going to want to read, then you already have them in the system and you don't need to keep spamming them, please sign up because that pisses off everybody and makes people really okay. upset. And so that's kind of where I've settled. Okay, very good point. What's yeah, your view about this? What, what's your name? Dan? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, real quick, we're kind of, when you say gating, you need basically to send a new capture system where you want to access certain information content first. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, my view on this is pretty simple. So, you know, I said about all I'm working on my phone is that you use the word yes, is giving them the taste. So, we're giving them really high quality, valuable content so they can build a core and trust with you in the brand. And then when they want more, as soon as they're about to get more, all they have to do is put their email and then they can take a more. So before you gate, of course you want to make sure that they feel like they can like and trust you so that when they their offers put it in them, of course they'll put in an email and just this concept was so good, you know, this yeah. this model. And this is a uh, this is a That's very uh, well respected strategy that you're you're describing. Sometimes it's called progressive profiling where we ask for one data point first, but not a lot, and then we ask for more later. And we also give away some content for free to establish, to establish our thought leadership and also um, develop that level of trust so that they'll be willing to give up information um, a bit beyond. Ken? So, I mean, I think it really should be you know, if you don't gate, you don't get. <laughs> Right. So that's like that. right? <laughs> if you don't throw up the gate, you don't get the opportunities that you're tagging on a lot. Yeah. So, but the other side of it is you want to generate traffic, you want to generate trust. So that's why most lots are in the free content. Right. So the strategy we use is really great blogging. So how many people here buy blog posts? This would be an interesting question. Yeah. Are you buying blog What does that mean, buying blog You're buying content. Right? So, well, well, buying content. So, yeah. there's a marketplace for content. Oh, hiring and a freelance writer? There are freelancers like writer access and other things. Okay. And you can buy a blog post for 30 bucks. That's probably a really bad blog post. Right. So, that would make people trust you as a content. Right. Person. I wouldn't So, I guess that. the point is, if you want to establish trust in great content, yeah. You have to spend a lot of money investing in as an asset, yeah. a lot of cost. 
and then you can get you guys have some have some views no, on this? No, I think it's all great conversation. I also think that you know it depends on who the owner of this content is, right? Mm -hmm. Like Ford Motor Company might be more apt to not gate, and a smaller company, um, maybe like Tesla, you know, might be more <laughs> right. focused on and know, certainly, understanding who those potential And certainly are. somebody like our our CRM software yeah, people. So what was your I thought? Think it also depends on one kind of content. If you're, if you're posting blog posts and podcast episodes to ask someone to give information to get a 400-word blog post, it's kind of silly, but if you're giving a 40-page ebook with really powerful tips yeah. at that point. Absolutely. I don't know anybody who gates blog, their right. blog, frankly. Right. What, what do you think, Ellen? Well, you know, it's, it's, I think the content and all this, it, there has to be a two-way street. And you know when you're doing, uh, fortunately, the software we have right now, as our friend Lindbeck just said, allows us to be less intrusive and obtrusive. Um, you know, in the HubSpot, they do have uh, smart forms. So if you filled out your name and your email address once, you never pre-populates the next time. Pre-populates, where you never even see those fields. So yeah. you want more information. Well, the thing about progressive profiling is that, coupled with uh, software that lets you dynamically deliver content, it helps you to be more meaningful to your visitors and, and yeah. your users. Once you know more about them, you can provide them with more useful content and deliver yeah. on what is going to help guide their journey to the finish line. That they Thank you so much for that. You know, this is a subject that is, I think, going to be a perennial debate topic, and certainly in business-to-business -business marketing. But I wanted to put it in the context of our desire to get our inbound visitors the chance to have a relationship with us, an ongoing dialogue. And so typically what marketers have done is gate, gate the content with a form like this. But in business markets, there's another method that you may not be familiar with. It's not available to consumer marketers, but this is known as IP address identification where I know, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, there are a number of providers who will put a small amount of code on your website and based on the corporate address of the visitor, you can find out what company they're, they belong to and you don't know their name, but some of the providers like Visitor Track here will send you an email alert that somebody from, who is this, Aramark, came to your site this morning. And by the way, here's the names and email and phone numbers of some senior executives at Aramark in case you want to follow up with them. And of course, the way to do that would not be to call them and say, I see. <laughs> you certainly don't want to do that. But you might want to call them or email them about your service offering, see if you can help solve their, their business problem. So uh, it's, a, it's an alternative that I, I wanted you to be, be familiar with. So with that, I'm going to, um, uh, oh, I know. I just had one little sort of side plug, which is sort of ridiculous. But thinking about how data impacts inbound, I've noticed that great content makes great use of data points mm -hmm. as a piece of content itself. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to sort of make, make that link. Here's a page from a, a terrific white paper. And it's you know all about, about charts and, and data points. So with that, I'm um, going to wrap up and have myself a glass of wine. <laughs> um, and I hope um, you guys have picked up some ideas. Um, so a few things, and we're going to wrap up the evening, but um, we do have a raffle. Did everybody put a business card in the pot before we do the raffle? Two. But two. Um, so where's our cards? Here they come. Any last cards? Anyone want to put a third, a fourth, a fifth card in? Stack the deck. Stack the deck.
And uh, we have a JBL jam box, I think. Is it here? Yeah. Can you bring it up, Cam? <laughs> the great Karnak says, Joe for Beats. Code Midas. Who's the Code Midas person? <laughs> All right. All right. So where do we got? We got it right here. Awesome. Thank you, guys. JBL. Come here. Come over here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell us who you are. What are you doing? What are you pitching? Yeah, sure. All right. Um, my name is Mark Espanol. Uh, I run a growth hacking company that incorporates pretty much everything that we've talked about here, using data and inbound tactics and compiling everything that now is marketing that has been siloed in the past and putting it together to build campaigns that leverage the best out of everything. And uh, we were consulting and now we run growth hacking boot camps, um, just like development boot camps, except training people to do the thing that we've been <coughs> super successful for. Um, and we focused on making it super step-by-step -step and repeatable so that people like, you know, if you're a marketer and you're an agency, that you can actually scale a lot faster instead of doing a lot of the repetitive activities such as research and design format for eBooks and all those things that really can be fixed and take on a lot. They're the little things that make or break your campaign. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And thank you again, guys, for this meetup. Because, uh, and how do people get in touch with you? Oh, yeah. Uh, you can get in touch with me. My site's codemidas.com, uh, C-O-D-E-M-I-D-A-S. Uh, it's a f super new company. Um, we've only been doing this for about a year, but before then I was doing this type of stuff for about two years as a private consultant. And uh, my email is mark, M-A-R-K, at codemidas.com. Outstanding. Thanks a lot, man. All right. Thank you. So uh, mark your calendars for July 20th. We've got Booker.com. Uh, they were nominated by a software company, um, Uberflip, uh, up in Toronto. They're actually flying, a I found out today, they're flying a founder down from Toronto to be part of this. So whatever we're doing, we're getting some really good juju around this. I mean, already Toronto wants to come in to New York. Um, but I think we got a lot of you know agency partners and software companies that are going to provide us content. We would love your ideas. You know, send me an email, uh, bend my ear. Uh, we're looking for ideas. Um, we're not going to run for August. Uh, we're going to take August off. So it's July twentieth, and then we're going to do something in December. Except there's two big conferences going on: Inbound up in Boston and the Content Marketing Institute's uh, conference out in Columbus. So I thought maybe we'd do a wrap of the two big conferences at the end of September or something like that. But yeah, we're getting nodding heads already. Um, so that's what we got. Really appreciate it. The last thing I want to do, by show of hands, um, what we're trying to do is build an audience and a community. We'd like the community to somewhat support it. So we, we're doing this for free now, and it's, it's Joseph and uh, Galileo Tech Media and ourselves that are funding it. But we'd really like your feedback. What would you be willing to pay? Right, food, wine, all this beautiful activity. Guys like Alex who come in and make the tech work so we can broadcast it. Uh, you know, all the stuff that makes this happen. We're not looking to make money, but we want a community. So I want to, I want to see it by a raise of hands. Um, how many would be willing to pay ten dollars for this meetup? Everyone, put your hands up. So what I want you to do is progress. No, keep them up. Keep them up. Way up. I want to see everyone hands? Okay, ten bucks. So keep your hand up if you'd be willing to pay twenty. I drop it if you would. So we got a half a hand, uh, half a hand here. That's the fifteen, right? And uh, okay, so twenty-five. So there's our spectrum. Like if we charge ten or twenty bucks, came in and have a few beers and some uh, some appetizers and some good content. Be sweet. Be good. I suggest you put it in the middle and go for 15. 15, all right. I mean, that way, because it's inflation and blood money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Today's presentation was excellent. So I'm answering the question based on what we've experienced today. So if you keep the quality, because even the people in the audience,
I think you got to pay him. You don't know all the people in the room. We had a lot of relationships. Right. But really, in terms of what you're doing, quality value content. proposition, this is the standard, and you're going to continue with that. And you keep it at 20 because we're going to be those uh, evangelists and messengers saying, mm -hmm. this is what we're doing because we'll be back because we want this and great. Keith, asked how many people were here last month who can testify to the quality. Yeah, how many people were here last month? So are, we're consistent two months in a row? Quality wise? Okay. So, yeah, what yeah. we. Um, I would also love to contribute more if there was like more transparency and like costs and things like that. And, you know, how Kickstarter has tiers for things like that. Because, you know, the power of how many people come in, an additional $2 when there's like 50 people is 100 bucks. Yeah. And that can really change the game. And that's a contribution of what? Two or Increase. Yeah, and we got 40 some odd people here, and, and I think the stats were getting another 10 online. So, you know, we're 50 people here. Um, so the next step is we're going to create a LinkedIn group and we'll link you guys to it for the meetup. And from there, we can start discussion. People are interested in participating more and want to lend their services, help us out, um, find speakers, recruit, whatever it is. Um, you'll be able to get in touch with us and we can start putting together a little editorial board for this thing. Yeah, I think the editorial board's key. Um, so we want your involvement. You know, this is going to work by building a community. So thanks, Alex. Great, great thoughts. Alex runs uh, social for um, a, lo a lot of sites. He does strategy and, and uh, sharp guy. So uh, thank you. Yeah. One quick comment as you get more and more expensive, you get fewer and fewer notions. If it's free, lots of people sign up. But they don't come because they don't see the value. Right. So, so we had about a forty percent didn't forty five percent didn't show today. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But it'd be prepaid. It would be prepaid. Yeah. And that's what's nice about the meetup. We can we can do uh, the the charging right out of the box with meetup. How many people feel this is something that's bothered me? Like I really want to make this a, a, a value added long-term relationship about making people smarter and better and building their network around inbound marketing. Um, do you feel that Meetup is an okay platform or is it too informal or no, thumbs up? Okay. Any other, we're, we're going to let people, yeah. I think I joined the other yeah. so I'm doing a lot of that. What is it? Uh, you joined this? Yeah. From Eventbrite? Yeah. <laughs> wow. You're gonna, you're gonna have to go look at the data. Um, we, we use Eventbrite for another one and we like it. You have a lot more control over the communications with the audience. Um, but Meetup has some good attributes as well. And, and my concern was it was less of an association or working group by being a Meetup. I didn't know if it had a certain, you know, connotation. But if you're not saying, you know, I mean, New York Tech Meetup is probably the most prestigious, you know, DC tech event in the city. And you even compared to other ones that are more formal. So I think that's kind of gone away. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, what what our intent to do is to get the programming to your your point is to get the programming focused at in-house agency, PR, and field sales groups, so that if we can focus on the needs of the end users, then the programming is going to be relevant to the people who really need to get this done. Agencies are welcome to join. Tech companies are welcome to join. But let's the, the hypothesis, and it seems to be holding so far, is focus on content that's interesting to the end <coughs> users. So. Um, I throw that out as a hypothesis to test it, so please come bend my ear. All right? Thank you, everybody. See you next month. And thank you.
So this is sweet. I used to be walking around town in this space. Thank you. 